forensic technique, secret history prepares to reveal the identity of the real Jack the Ripper. This is a modern detective story, and it's the story of a clue that the world once knew and then forgot about, or covered up. That clue is the key to the most notorious mystery in the history of crime. For more than 30 years it lay neglected, a dusty sheet of paper buried in an old bookshop. But now it's the start of a trail that leads straight to the forgotten prime suspect in the Whitechapel murders of 1888. Well, it seemed inconceivable to us that he could be missed by everybody, every researcher, every author you know, since the actual, any books been written on the subject, but that's exactly what happened. The Victorian police had a vital clue, but it's been left until now for a Suffolk police constable to discover. It has been the dream of researchers for years to put a name to the unknown killer of the East End, we have found a leading police suspect, a prime police suspect. We believe at last we have put a name to Jack the Ripper. The story of Jack the Ripper top attraction at the London Dungeon has always been the stuff of melodrama. Shrouded in fog and folklore, the Ripper story is infested with bogus theories and suspects. Elizabeth Brayton, who lives in a room of half hears a faint cry. <laughs> Cutting through the fiction, this is a film about the forensic facts. London in the late 1880s was the prosperous powerhouse of a seemingly eternal empire. The largest city on earth, an example to the world of all that was solid and stable. But as with so much of the Ripper story, all was not what it seemed. London was a tale of two cities. In the East End there was squalor rivaling anything in the Asiatic dominions of Queen Victoria. Soon the poor would camp in St James's Park. The derelict stone the Pall Mall clubs. The unemployed fight the police in Trafalgar Square. Even before the Ripper struck, this was a society on the edge of panic. As for Victorian moral values, the Lancet estimated that one in 16 women was prepared to sell herself. When you look at the documentation, women are prostituting themselves for threepence, twopence, or a loaf of stale bread. This is the, the, the brutality of that, of that East End life. Now, many of these women would never have been prostitutes, um, except for the fact that they are just on the streets, just, just to, to survive. In the richest city in the world, Whitechapel families slept seven to a room. More than half of all East End children were dead before the age of five. Some families prayed that their children would reach their teenage years so that they could command the highest prices from their clients before alcohol or venereal disease reduced their earning power. These were the people who were to provide Britain's most infamous serial killer with his victims.
So the East End was just full of these little alleys, little oh, yeah. Yes, a maze of cobbled alleyways. On each side, one-storied, leprous-coloured cottages, open middens. This was a typical pick-up point for prostitutes, for their clients from the West End. Here today, the prostitutes still use as their rendezvous for clients. This was an area of a concentration of the unemployed, the unemployable, the feckless, the transient. This particular area summarized that uh, title, The City of Dreadful Night. And there was fear amongst the uh, ruling classes that the workers were ready to rebel. And there were warnings coming from the local press. You've got to do something about these people of the East End of London particularly. Otherwise, they will cut your throats. But instead, the East End was to turn the violence upon itself. In the autumn of 1888, there began a brief and terrible series of killings. The murders of so-called fallen women here in Whitechapel. Police H Division. It was close to the Whitechapel Road, the main archery of H Division, that the first victim was last seen alive in the small hours of August the 31st, 1888. At the time of her death, Polly Nichols was 42, drunk, and missing five of her front teeth. But what shocked the police was the damage her body had suffered after death. The inquest found that Nichols had been cut apart with what the coroner was to call some rough anatomical knowledge. After death by apparent strangulation, her windpipe and gullet had been severed, the cut going as deep as the spinal cord. A jagged slash had opened her abdomen. Stranger and more disturbing still were two small stab wounds on the vagina. Nichols was one of the first ever murder victims to be photographed. The picture was filed at Scotland Yard. But why did these murders make the impact that still echoes today? One answer lies with the hungry and massively expanding press. In the 35 years before the murders, thanks to literacy and the abolition of the newspaper tax, the number of papers had grown from 14 to 168. All the main elements of what came to be called tabloid journalism about 10 years later were around by the mid-1880s. They really only come into focus in autumn 1888 with the Whitechapel murders, where you've got a headline story, another shocking murder. In fact, uh, another, I mean, when, when Polly Nichols is killed, uh, they rope in uh, various pr earlier murder, murders in the East End in order to turn it into a serial, even before it's a serial. So you've got your headlines. You've got interviews with all and sundry uh, until the police start clamming up. Um, you've got illustrations of the locate Miller's Court, Hanbury Street, policemen with bulldog lamp looking for body, those sort of illustrations. You've got all those things. And in a way, you could say that the Ripper murders turn tabloid journalism into a cliché for the first time. One newspaper called The Star started life a few months earlier and really took off on the back of the murders. Eight days after the first attack, a reliable witness noticed an important encounter. Mrs. Elizabeth Long saw a middle-aged man wearing a brown deer stalker talking to a woman called Annie Chapman. Long thought the man was a foreigner. She heard him ask, will you? And Chapman answer, yes. Half an hour later, and half a mile from the scene of the first murder, Chapman's body was found. Mrs. Long managed to identify it as the woman she'd seen. Her intestines had been partly detached and placed over her shoulder. Part of the bladder had been removed. Now the problem with the Ripper story is that um, you've got drama without an actor. Um, you've got sensationalism, but 
you're not allowed to say anything about the post-mortem after the first murder. So all sorts of strange phenomena begin to happen to make a story out of it. Among them, the first hoax letter forwarded to Scotland Yard. We have now established that it was, in fact, written by two journalists. They wanted to give the story an extra spin by coining the famous nickname. It was a, a name uh, very common in Victorian penny dreadfuls. Jack-o'-lantern, Jack Shepherd, spring Jack, the terror of the East End. Jack, 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 you know, Jack Tar. So Jack is the common hero-villain of comics. So Jack the Ripper. At Annie Chapman's inquest, the flamboyant coroner Wynne Baxter suggested that the killer must have been someone himself accustomed to the post-mortem room. Adding sensation to horror, he revealed that some items were missing from the body. The uterus and a couple of cheap imitation gold rings. Baxter's verdict that the desire to possess the missing organ had been the object of the attack and the theft of the rings an attempt to disguise the true motive. Both the rings and the organ will, as we shall see, prove significant. So too was Baxter's disclosure that the sub-curator of London's Pathological Museum had recently been approached by a man asking to buy a number of uteruses. He'd offered £20 apiece, but the curator had turned him down. The man was an American doctor. In spite of the refusal, we know that an American later made similar requests elsewhere. After three weeks of fearful calm in the East End, the Ripper struck again. And it seems struck twice in a single night. The first victim was Elizabeth Stride. She was a 44-year-old prostitute. Her body didn't have the by now typical signs of genital mutilation. Perhaps the attacker had been disturbed. Stride's body was found in Burner Street, parallel to a road called Batty Street, as we'll discover their significance in the scene of crime. A 12-minute walk away and half an hour later, the Ripper gave full vent to his fury. The next victim had been ripped open, said the city police, like a pig in the market. Catherine Eddowes' throat had been cut. Again, her uterus and this time one of her kidneys had been removed. The killer had even savaged her face. He certainly appears to have had some basic anatomical knowledge, in other words, where he can find a kidney, um, and to remove the uterus. It's unlikely that he would have not known roughly where the organs were in, in the body. But certainly from the pattern of cutting that there is, there is no sign that he was used to handling a knife. Uh, perhaps on the fringes of the medical world, perhaps somebody who's trying to disguise that he may be, may be more on than on the fringes of the medical world. The police surgeons of the day said that to do that amount of evisceration would have taken about 15 minutes or so. Is that your view? About two minutes. Two minutes. That's right. It's being very crudely done. Crudely, rapidly done. Moving a knife quickly, I would imagine that everything could have been done perhaps in two, perhaps in three minutes. At last, the police found a clue. A piece of the victim's apron covered in blood some distance from the body and showing the direction in which the killer must have fled in panic, back towards Burner Street and Batty Street. He's showing signs of what we would term increasing disorganization as time goes on. Uh, he takes a lot of risks. Um, 
in a heavily populated area of London, gives himself very little time, high risk of capture, or certainly being identified. The search intensified. 2,000 people were interviewed, 80 suspects arrested. But the serial killer is a loner. He has no associates to inform on him, and the dragnet revealed nothing. There were 8,000 bobbies on the beat, but a mere handful of CID to direct them. In more ways than one, as an increasingly critical press implied, the police were working in the dark. There was to be one more victim, the fifth and final. Mary Kelly was the youngest and attractive Irish girl of 25. She was single and three months behind with her rent. At midnight, she went to an alley near Spitalfields Market. Witnesses had seen her with two different men during the night. A neighbor heard her singing, Only a violet I plucked from my mother's grave. There had been a blazing fire in the hearth that night. In the morning, when the man came to collect the rent, he was horrified by what he saw. The bedroom was a slaughterhouse. Kelly had been disemboweled, the remains scattered over her bed and piled on a side table. In the hope that the retina would retain her killer's image, the police even took photographs of Mary Kelly's eyes. But as secret history has discovered, one senior policeman was unwittingly on a more promising tack. As head of a secret department at Scotland Yard, his job was to shadow Irish terrorists. Himself almost the victim of a bomb attack, was doubly fortunate because its little child who has left us the clue to a hitherto unknown prime suspect he knew his name as we do now after a silence that has lasted for more than a century After a lifetime devoted to his bookshop in Richmond, the owner had decided to retire. While he was tidying up, Eric Barton came across a dusty old bundle of letters relating to the Whitechapel horrors. I um, gave very little attention to the uh, letters which I had. <laughs> 
And then I decided, as I was going to close down, that I uh, could get rid of um, a great many things, including these letters. I, was, I had no, no, no particular interest in the letters. I, I realized that everybody who had written about Jack the Ripper would receive masses of letters. Scotland Yard, I believe, destroyed thousands of letters. And I had no reason to think that in these particular letters that I had there was any vital clue. But one letter in the bundle rewrites the entire history of the Ripper. Written by Little Child of the Special Branch and missing for 80 years, it's a piece of the jigsaw that at last makes sense of what's been till now a jumble of seemingly unrelated facts. For the first time, Little Child gives us the name of Scotland Yard's prime suspect for the Ripper murders. But amongst the suspects, and to my mind, a very likely one, he was an American quack named Tumblety, and was at one time a frequent visitor to London, and on these occasions constantly brought under the notice of police, there being a large dossier concerning the wire Scotland Yard. But his feelings towards women were remarkable and bitter in the extreme, a fact on record. He shortly left the line and was never heard of afterwards. Faithfully yours, J.G. Littlechild. The man who was to buy the Littlechild letter was also a policeman. Stuart Evans is a constable in the Suffolk force. He's been a keen collector of Ripper material since the age of 16. Have you received that? Uh, I take it you want scenes of crime, over. Evans went home to sort through Eric Barton's material for anything that would add to his own collection. But nothing prepared him for what he was to find in the Little Child letter. I was absolutely amazed to see a name in Little Child's letter that I'd never seen before. Having researched the subject, read all the books for nearly 30 years, I couldn't believe I was reading the name of what was obviously a prime police suspect that nobody had ever heard of before. But who was he? And why did the Yard have Tumblety in their sights? This man was an Irish-American and had very, very strong Irish leanings. He travelled frequently to London, about twice a year. And I'm sure Little Child, as head of the special branch, of course, watching all Fenian activities in the capital, would certainly be aware of his movements and he would be a known Fenian sympathiser. So this would explain how Little Child probably knew a lot about him. Little Child's letter was written 25 years after the murders in reply to a journalist called George Sims. Sims was a veteran of the Ripper story. He'd covered the case and become such a familiar face in Whitechapel that he had himself even been suspected of being the killer. The whole of Ripper history is full of forgery and fraud. How can we be sure that Little Child's reply to Sims, naming Tumblety as the suspect, is genuine. Forensic scientist Audrey Giles is a former head of the suspect document department at Scotland Yard. I've looked at the typewriting, I've looked at the paper, and I've looked at the handwriting of the letter. Now as far as the paper is concerned, there's no doubt that it's paper from the correct period. It's got the right watermark in it, it's the right size, and it's even got the right spacing of the lines. It's obviously it's a very old typewriter, an old manual type bar machine. And of course then there's the ink of the typewriting itself. And that's purple. And that was very common at that particular time. The handwriting's interesting. Now the first thing about it, there's quite a lot of it on the final page and there's a signature and it's all very fluent there's no evidence of any hesitations in the handwriting any retouching or any going over again we've got one signature of little child from his pension records now that those were made some years later 
but it looks very good. And as far as I can see, there's nothing which raises a question over this being a genuine document. But what was there to corroborate the existence of an American suspect? Evans found a reference in the Pall Mall Gazette to a Scotland Yard detective called Andrews. Andrews, one of the main detectives on the case, had been sent to New York. And there was that otherwise inexplicable mention by the coroner, Wynne Baxter, of a man who had been pestering the pathological museum for samples. The man had been reported as being an American, an American doctor. And Evans discovered that Sims, too, had learnt of an American doctor identified as the killer. I bought an old scrapbook of cuttings and in it was a cutting dated 1911 and it was an article by Sims about Jack the Ripper. Now the incredible thing about this was Sims indicated that in 1907 or 1908 he was visited by a lady who claimed that the Whitechapel fiend, as she termed him, was her lodger and that he returned to the house at 2am on the night of the double murder. Moreover, this man was an American doctor. Secret history can now confirm that a Whitechapel lodging house was under suspicion. Only 10 minutes walk away from all of the Ripper murders is number 22 Batty Street, the street next to where Elizabeth Stride was found on the night of the double murders. At the time of the murders, there had been reports of a blood-stained garment left by a mysterious lodger at a Whitechapel boarding house. the lodger had come back to his room that night with blood on him. The press were on to the story. There were even hints of an imminent arrest. Here was a story that had appeared in all the national newspapers, or virtually all the national newspapers, even the provincial ones, such as our local paper. And it was a story that no other researcher or author had picked up on. Here was a man who returned to his lodging house on the night of the double murder in the early hours of the morning with bloodstains on him and was spotted by his landlady. And it amazed me that nobody had ever picked up on this story. And in fact, it unlocked the key to a chain of subsequent events which all indicated they were looking for an American. Press reports confirmed that the boarding house at 22 Batty Street was being watched. It looked as if the case and the suspect was about to crack. But the lodger seemed to be aware that he was under police surveillance. Evans joined forces with a colleague at work, Paul Ganey. They knew about the watch on a suspect lodger at Batty Street, but now they found evidence of a parallel line of inquiry. The Daily Globe's coverage of the East End murders carried an authoritative report of a hotel guest who was in the habit of slumming in the more squalid parts of the East End. He'd left behind a black leather bag. The black bag had been advertised in the lost property columns by the Charing Cross Hotel after the guest abruptly left without leaving any forwarding address. Police took possession of the bag and went through the contents. There was wearing apparel, checkbooks and prints of an obscene nature. We've discovered that police cabled America after finding the checkbook. Tumblety had an account in San Francisco. Scotland Yard wanted samples of his writing. Was Tumblety both the mystery hotel guest and the secret slummer of the East End? Just as the police hunt seemed to reach a climax, the press fell strangely silent. There are no further references to the Batty Street lead. Instead, a series of police denials of any development at all, at least in the British press. <laughs>
But then Ganey began to trawl the American papers to see if there was any mention there of the little child suspect, Tumblety. I thought we'd have to comb through tons and tons of newspapers to find just a small reference or a small mention of his name. Of course, what we found was the complete opposite. There he was, huge headlines, huge bright lines. He was enormous in the American press. Uh, he was on every page. So he was there all the time. But what is inconceivable is every Ripper researcher and every Ripper author has missed this man, and he's there, easily found by anyone who just even takes a cursory look. One newspaper contained a particular historical time bomb. The New York World confirmed that Dr. Twombleti had actually been arrested in Britain. The police couldn't hold him on suspicion, but they charged him with gross indecency. So why did the police let him go? The charge that he was arrested on was a misdemeanor. There was no way they could hold him. It was very much the same in those days as today. You have to charge a man or take him before a court within 24 hours, or you have to release him on police bail. And I think all the indications are he was released on police bail. But if he was a principal suspect for the Whitechapel murder, um, they would have found some way of hanging on to him, or at least following him after they'd released him on bail, wouldn't they? Well, I mean, the rule of habeas corpus applied then, as it does now, and unfortunately, unless they had the evidence, and bearing in mind there was no forensic aid to the police in those days, they had nothing to hold him on with regard to the murders. The arrest had also been featured in the little child letter. And further corroboration came to light with the discovery of British court records. This document confirms that on November the 7th, two days before the last Ripper murder, Francis Tumblety, aged 56 and describing himself as a physician, was arrested for acts of gross indecency with four men. He was remanded to answer bail at the next session. But he never did. The moment that he's bailed, he, he, he vanishes. Uh, he goes across to France, gets on the steamer back to the States. Pursued by Inspector Walter Andrews, and why that is particularly significant, of course, is Walter Andrews is one of the top inspectors actually investigating the river crime on the ground. We then know that Andrews and his team arrived in, later in the month, by which time Tumblety had fled. He disappeared on the 5th of December, only two days after landing in New York. He fled his lodgings, and they saw him no more. Secret history followed Inspector Andrews' ill-fated quest across the Atlantic. Scotland Yard had lost the trail, but the American press was to pick it up. What did they discover about Francis Tumblety? On the afternoon of December the 4th, 1888, the liner La Bretagne tied up at New York. Among the passengers, according to contemporary reports looking pale and excited, was the prime suspect in the Whitechapel murder case. Although he'd travelled via France under the alias Frank Townsend, there was a reception committee, two stern-looking local detectives and the New York press corps. They were chasing round trying to find acquaintances, friends, surviving members of his family to get every detail on the man's background and life. Detailed interviews about his character, his background, what he had done. And then questions like, well, do you think he could be Jack the Ripper? I mean, and them saying, yes, you know, from what I know about him, it wouldn't surprise me if he was the Whitechapel killer. Tumblety shook off the pressmen, but their pursuit of the mysterious suspect took reporters to Tumblety's hometown. Rochester, in upstate New York, is two hours' drive from the Canadian border. 
Timothy claimed to have been born in Dublin, but this was the street where he grew up, according to residents interviewed by reporters, like a neglected weed. In the 1840s, the area was home to the immigrant Irish. Today, it's a poor black neighborhood. Rochester in those days was a rugged pioneer township. A new canal nicknamed Clinton's Ditch after the then governor of New York State had opened up America's northeast frontier. In the 1850s, the canal bustled with traffic and there was brisk business on the towpath. According to a Captain W.C. Streeter interviewed by the New York World, the young Tumblety earned his first dollar peddling pornography to the boatmen. This inn has changed little since it served those who built and plied the canal. This, this fellow, Francis Tumblety from, from Rochester, I mean, he's, he's reported as selling pornography. I mean, does that fit into the, the sort of scene that, that you can imagine? Uh, I, could, I could well imagine that because, you see, with the Okanagan Canal, they brought up such a, a variety of people into the, the new frontier, and I'm sure the influx of, st of strangers from different parts of the world were instrumental in, in bringing that in. Well, a pornographer wouldn't flourish in those surroundings, would he? Well, I, I think they probably did, but in a more discreet uh, manner than maybe we have today. Would this youthful involvement in pornography find an echo 30 years later in the bag at the Charing Cross Hotel and the obscene items found among its contents? Records in the city library led us next to a now derelict building in downtown Rochester, a former hospital. He drifted into medicine in the most bizarre fashion. It looked like he worked sweeping the floors at what was called the Lisbonard Hospital, and he gained what little knowledge he had of medicine probably in those years he spent doing menial tasks. Lisbonard's hospital had a reputation for abortion, crude hysterectomy, and the adolescent ailments of young men. Lisbonard's advertised a cure to those made ill by self-abuse, who by indulging in secret habits have contracted that soul-subduing, mind-prostrating, body-destroying vice. But of what happened next, there's barely a clue. All we know is that Tumblety left Rochester a penniless paramedical menial and returned ten years later in triumph. In 1858, with the season's fashionable greyhound at his heels and a black manservant in attendance, he's described by a Rochester resident as the wonder of the city. American reporters interviewed a young male friend of Tumblety and discovered that the basis of his fortune was almost certainly patent medicine. Linctus, liniment and Tumblety's potent pimple destroyer sold in heroic quantities. America, a nation obsessed by novelty and hypochondria, was a paradise for the charlatan. Styling himself an electric physician, Tumblety was known by others as Prince of Quacks. We found that his practice of medicine didn't simply break convention. More than once, it broke the law. He had two major brushes with the law. The first being an attempt to procure an abortion on a French prostitute called Philomena Dumas, in which he was arrested. He didn't actually stand trial for that. That was another uh, example of him actually getting off, although he, he was subjected to some serious questioning about it. And more importantly, there was the poisoning of James Portmore, who was a joiner who basically had applied to one of his abbots in his paper and asked for some of his medicine. He suffered from a, a kidney complaint. What basically happened was Tumbley poisoned him, and within days of him taking this medicine, he died. And why this is so crucial is Tumbley was arrested and would have stood trial for manslaughter. And of course, he does yet another one of these disappearing acts and vanishes into the night. Uh, basically, once again, a fugitive from the law. <laughs>
At such times, living on his wits and on the brink of disaster, Tumblety used to give police the slip through the intimate knowledge he had of the frontier with Canada. Like Houdini on his tightrope, Tumblety too was a master of Niagara. This is the border across which Francis Tumblety would flit, always living on the edge of danger, crisscrossing from Canada back to the United States, across to Canada again to evade the law and his pursuers. Sometimes he would dye his face a copper colour and pass himself off as an Indian herb doctor, this elusive magician of fraud. The only picture of Tumblety shows him, characteristically, wearing a uniform to which he was not entitled. His writings include this account of an earlier wrongful arrest. The shadowy suspect of Whitechapel was also, it seems, a flamboyant self-publicist. But as the press discovered, Tumblety had a secret and sinister obsession. A reporter from the New York World went to interview a Colonel Dunham a lawyer who'd known the doctor in Washington. He told the reporter of a dinner conversation when he was a guest of Tumblety. It was a men-only affair. Someone asked why he hadn't invited any women to his dinner. His face instantly became as black as a thundercloud. He had a pack of cards in his hand, but he put them down and said almost savagely, No, Colonel, I don't know any such cattle, but if I did, I would, as your friend, sooner give you a dose of quick poison than take you into such danger. He then broke into a homily on the sin and folly of dissipation, fiercely denounced all women, especially fallen women. He then invited us into his office to illustrate his lecture, so to speak. One side of this room was entirely occupied with cases. Quite a museum was revealed. Tiers of shelves with glass jars and cases, some round and others square, filled with all sorts of anatomical specimens. The doctor placed on a table a dozen or more jars containing, as he said, the matrices or wombs of every class of women. Nearly half of one of these cases was occupied exclusively with these specimens. Some people keep trophies, some killers keep trophies. The trophies could include eyes, pieces of skin, organs, including the genital organs. There's a case in Hong Kong where a taxi driver killed a number of women and kept all their uteruses and kept them in glass jars in his flat. So it's perfectly feasible that this man has removed Edo's uterus as a trophy. The most important thing about Tumblety, of course, is that he is a bisexual. He basically married at a very young age. A woman then turned out to be a prostitute, a woman who was actually being an actual prostitute during their marriage. He finds this out by following her to a brothel. He then ends their relationship and basically, in his own words, turns against all womankind. I take it it's at that, that point where he then became more interested. He turned to men for sexual favours and hence uh, began a whole new chapter to his life. One major sexual chapter involved another exotic figure, the best-selling English novelist Paul Kane. Kane's biographer stumbled on Tumblety's Ripper connections just as she had unearthed a cache of his letters to Kane. Apparently, um, Tumblety, wherever he went, got a coterie of young men around him and appeared almost to bewitch them, and I think he bewitched Kane for a start. Their relationship was certainly close. Um, it gives the impression of being close and passionate at one stage. And the final letters that Tumulty wrote from America are fairly explicit. They're going to be interpreted one way. But the impression was of a con man and of somebody very smooth, friendly and affectionate on the surface. And then just every so often, there's something that's quite vicious or peremptory demands for money to be telegraphed to him and things like this so that you could see that there was something rather nasty underneath. More typical than such great romances were Tumblety's casual pickups, cruising the streets of whatever city he was passing through. 
sexually, Tumblety was no lady killer. Psychologically, would a homosexual have committed a series of apparent sex murders? There's nothing in terms of the evidence available at that time which show without a doubt that these were committed by somebody in a state of sexual arousal, say. There weren't actually objects inserted into the body. There was no evidence of semen at the, the scene of the crime. There is no evidence that shows definitively that this was committed due to sexual sadism. But isn't it a simplistic suggestion that Tumblety turned his rage on the female sex out of mere resentment of his wife's infidelity? A number of um, patients of mine who I've, I've had under my care have actually believed that their wives have been unfaithful to them or indeed have been prostitutes and have attacked them on that basis of what actually is a false and delusional belief. Now, if one wishes to speculate down the, in, in the hypothesis that he was psychotic, it is possible that his illness started with a delusional belief of infidelity in, in his wife uh, and progressed further to a, a hatred involving all women as being unfaithful and uh, betrayers of men who had to be punished. As a Victorian serial killer, Tumblety's personality profile fits the expert opinion of those who study his modern counterparts. But what of the facts? We now know that Tumblety had a criminal record and there's evidence that as a quack he had killed before. Unlike some other suspects, at least Tumblety was in London when all the attacks happened and they stopped when he left. One of his indecency offences was committed on the day of the first murder. Other offences were all on the same days of the week as the other murders. We know the police were watching Batty Street and looking for an American doctor who went slumming in the East End. And we know that an American disappeared from the Batty Street lodgings after the discovery of a blood-stained shirt by his landlady on the night of the double murder. Further grounds for suspicion was Tumblety's pathological hatred of women. His early life as a canal-side pornographer fits the obscene pictures found in the abandoned bag. All the murders except one targeted the womb. Coroner Baxter had reported an American who was trying to buy uteruses, and Tumblety did have a collection of his own. I think the accumulation of, of circumstantial evidence is beyond coincidence, and I feel fairly satisfied myself that we've found the man, we found Jack the Ripper. But in fact, of course, as a policeman, I must say honestly that there wouldn't be enough to get him to a court of law and convict him of murder. But surely there'd have been enough for the police to hold him and get a confession out of the man, almost the only way to get a Victorian conviction. Tantalizingly, little child hints at the existence of a thick police file on the American suspect. But for reasons we can only guess at, the large dossier on Tumblety he refers to has gone missing from Scotland Yard. And why, when the American papers had the full story, did the British press abandon it? News, even then, travelled far. Unless, perhaps, the story had been killed in Britain. At the time, there was tremendous pressure on Scotland Yard to catch some of these murders. Imagine their embarrassment when their prime suspect is arrested. He then is bailed and escapes. Imagine the embarrassment. Imagine how battered the credibility of CID would have been. Imagine how many careers would have been ruined. Now what better way to avoid all of that embarrassment than just to forget the thing ever happened, to just let it go away, not to mention it. So it just slips away unnoticed and that's exactly what happened. And let's be honest about it, if it wasn't for John Littlechild it would still be unknown today. Francis Tumblety is buried in a family plot in the graveyard at Rochester, New York, among the American Irish. Typically for such an elusive figure, his name is carved in one of its many various spellings, Tamuelty. And there's one last clue from beyond the grave. When he died, 
the nuns who were cared for him in their final days at the St. John's Hospital in St. Louis, uh, made a personal inventory of the things actually on his body. And it included the things you'd expect from a flamboyant dresser, diamond cl cluster rings, gold pocket watch, several expensive pieces of jewelry. And then the final thing on the list, two imitation gold rings, value $3, identical to the two that were wrenched from Annie Chapman's fingers during the Whitechapel murders in 1888. The question, of course, are they the same rings? Very difficult to say, but is it possible that he carried these trophies with him for the rest of his life?